and moving on to our keynote lecture. The keynote lecture today is given by Dr. Dominic Obris. He received a PhD from the Department of Applied Mathematics at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's had experience working at the supercomputer company Cray, and he's currently a professor of cardiovascular engineering at ARTORG, the Center for Cardiovascular Biomedical Fluid Mechanics. Today, he'll be presenting a very interesting talk on microscopic lesions of the transport system of organs and their relation to clinically observable large-scale phenomena. And so I will now stop sharing my screen so we can hear his presentation. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Laura, for the introduction. And uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers for the invitation. And uh, I think at this point, I'd also like to say that I really appreciate the efforts that have been made to get this uh, conference uh, going uh, in these difficult times. So really appreciate it. But now uh, to the topic of my, my talk, microscopical lesions of the transport system of organs. Uh, what I mean by that are, are uh, possibly blockages of capillaries and similar things. And what is common to all these microscopical lesions is uh, that we cannot observe them with classical clinical imaging modalities. Uh, we just cannot resolve them, cannot see them. So somehow we need to, to use uh, our tools to, to connect them to large scale observations to make, uh, uh, give the clinicians tools to better diagnose and, and, and treat. Problems. Why is this important? Well, uh, I will show you in the following uh, five examples of such diseases which are connected to microscopical lesions. Take, for instance, uh, the first example the microvascular obstruction of the heart muscle. Uh, microvascular obstruction is uh, connected to heart attack. It may occur after heart attack. And we all know heart attack is a, is a relatively common uh, condition affects uh, over 800,000 people every year in the U.S. alone. Uh, and cardiovascular diseases are the major cause of death in the uh, industrialized world. Luckily, uh, there's a very good treatment for heart attack. Uh, if you present uh, at a hospital with a heart attack, probably uh, one of your larger coronary arteries, let's say about two millimeters in diameter, will look like that, you will have probably a blood clot blocking uh, the blood flow. Uh, what the doctors can do, they can use catheters with balloons integrated uh, to, to uh, open up this blockage, remove the blood clot. Maybe they will also place such a wireframe stent to keep uh, uh, this, this, uh, this site open and the blood flow going. So a uh, problem uh, solved. Uh, well, however, uh, about 40% of all patients uh, do not recover well from a heart attack, uh, even after successful primary treatment. And some may even go into heart failure. And we may ask ourselves now, why is that happening? Why does a successful primary and quick treatment not help these patients? Well, part of that is the microvascular obstruction of the myocardium. And as the name says, it's an obstruction not in the larger arteries, but in the smallest vessels of the microcirculation. We see here on the right uh, histology of a vessel. I think it's approximately 200 microns large. And there's a, a blood clot inside this vessel. So where does it come from? Probably during the primary intervention, um, the primary blood clot fell apart and debris from that blood clot was flushed downstream and obstructed the small vessels. There are also other causes like swelling or edema in the microcirculation that you see here. Now, all these blockages cannot be seen by this image. This is what the, the doctor sees, what the cardiologist sees. And it's an X-ray, continuous X-ray. They inject a contrast agent and see the larger blood vessels, but they don't see these small vessels. And the catheters they're using are too big to access these small scale uh, lesions. 
So we have a scale problem here. And let me give you another example. Small for size syndrome of the liver. The liver is a, is a large organ. It's heavily perfused. There's approximately 20% of the whole bloodstream going through the body. 20% of that goes through the liver itself. If uh, you have a tumor, you have liver cancer with a tumor, there's a, a treatment to that, which is a, which works quite well, and it's liver resection. You cut off the piece of the liver, you cut off the piece uh, with, with the tumor in it. Why does that work? Well, the liver is an organ that can regenerate. The liver will regrow, will grow back to its normal size, original size, in the course of weeks to, to months, actually. Now, this only works to a certain limit. You cannot cut off too much. The remaining piece of liver should be, and that is a, it's a rough number, it's a roughly at least 30% of the original number. If you cut off too much, the liver cannot recover and you run into the small precise syndrome. Now, again, we can ask ourselves, why is this happening? And uh, we actually participate in the study with uh, visceral surgeons uh, where uh, we used a pig model to study uh, liver resection and small for size syndrome. So uh, the liver was heavily resected, 70% uh, and more was resected. And we study the large scale uh, uh, parameters like the flow through this portal vein here, this blue vein. That's the major vein going into the liver. Uh, with uh, roughly one, 1 1.2 liters per minute uh, flow flow. Now, uh, you have to think of the liver as a spongy structure. And uh, if you remove um, uh, two thirds of that liver, only one third will remain. And uh, you can uh, imagine that the resistance should roughly triple by doing that. And uh, because you have a more or less constant pressure gradient across the liver, uh, your flow should also decrease significantly after liver resection. And that, that's exactly what happens. You see this plot here, this curve here, uh, see the portal vein flow pre-resection about 1.1, 1.2 liters, post-resection about 0 0.7 liters per minute. At the same time, the calculated resistance, the transhepatic resistance increased significantly. That was expected and normal. What happened afterward was not expected. Look at hours zero after resection down to, let's say about 12 hours after resection. The blood flow through the portal vein recovers. And then we get back to normal blood flow rate, even though we have only 30% of the liver left. So this remnant piece of liver is definitely massively overperfused. And that's probably one of the, the issues. And we can dig deeper. If we look, at the anatomy of the liver, we see the liver comprises several of these so-called lobules, hexagonal structures. And inside these lobules, there are uh, small uh, uh, vessels, uh, some of them called sinusoids. Uh, these are like capillary vessels of approximately 10 microns in diameter, and they are fenestry. Uh, they have little holes in it which are there for the exchange of substances with the surrounding hepatic cells. Uh, what we found is that uh, due to this uh, um, uh, liver resection, the size of these fenestrations increased significantly, doubled or even tripled. And if you look at here, a uh, uh, histology of, of, of such a vessel, you see here in the control, these gaps, these are the normal, the healthy fenestrations. And after liver resection, you have these, these, these huge, essentially torn apart structures. So what we think that happened here is actually that this, this uh, uh, overperfusion of the liver tore apart the structures inside the liver. So again, we have microscopic lesions, but what we can measure and what we can deal with in a clinical situation is large scale. So based on these two examples, I would like to postulate uh, that there's a, a scale challenge in clinical medicine. And by that, I mean that the imaging modalities here in that case, it's the fluoroscopy, but the same would be true 
for a CT or for MRI, that they are just not reaching the resolution that we would need to resolve these small scale uh, uh, structures where the lesions are actually happening. The same is true for uh, surgical tools, uh, for interventional tools like catheters. There's a certain size limit. So what we have is a certain scale gap between the lesion scale and what I would like to call the organ scale here. It's about one to two orders of magnitude. Uh, to get better treatment diagnosis, we need to overcome the scale gap somehow. Uh, one approach, of course, is to miniaturize our tools. That can be done to a certain extent. And to improve the imaging modalities. Now, this constantly happening. I just, uh, a few weeks ago, received this picture from a good colleague from uh, neuroradiology, and uh, he showed me a scan. This is the same patient on the left and on the right with a, with a massive uh, lesion here uh, at this point. The picture on the left was taken with a three Tesla MRI system, a uh, system you commonly find in hospitals nowadays. And on the right, this is a seven Tesla system. So bigger system or let's see, more massive system, better resolution. And of course, it's uh, impressive how you can resolve these small blood vessels here or here at the edema. You see uh, cross sections of, of very small blood vessels. But still, the voxel size here, it's about 0.4 millimeters, is still too large to resolve these lesions at microscopic scale. So we can also come from the other end, from the small scale, or as I would like to call it here, the poor scale of organs. So as an example, on the left, this is a, a, an experimental study uh, we did uh, for blood flow in capillaries, or actually microchannels here. They have a width of, uh, let's say, 9 to 10 microns, so similar to capillaries. And these uh, red cells here are actual red blood cells. And you see how they uh, heavily deform. There's particle-particle interaction. Uh, there's, there's fluid particle interaction, complex uh, mechanics. And what is interesting here is to find out, to understand the mechanisms which uh, tells the particles whether they should go left or right, because they carry the oxygen, and wherever they go, you will get oxygen. You can take this uh, 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 game a step farther, and you can combine several of these bifurcations in a larger network model, which then models the full um, uh, uh, capillary bed. And uh, whatever happens at these single bifurcations has an effect on a network scale. And uh, you will find that there are preferential pathways through which your blood cells uh, preferentially go. There are other vessels with much less flow, with fewer red blood cells, or there are even vessels which are completely depleted. Of Next step, this is also an experiment on the right-hand side. Just couldn't find a movie for that. This is a recent experiment we did where we took such a network and integrated uh, active elements. So here where you see the green circle, this is where we have an active element which can dilate locally uh, the capillary vessel. And by opening this vessel, you change the flow in the whole network. You mod modify the flow and uh, you rearrange, or let's say reshuffle uh, the, 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 the place where red blood cells are, so where the oxygen is going, so which part of the tissue can be oxygen. And you see in the red parts, you have a significant increase, let's say by about 20% of the hematocrit, whereas here on the top part, you have a decrease by, let's say, 15% of the hematocrit. So that's about, uh, what you can do on these super small scales, but of course there's also limit uh, uh, going larger, right? And at one point you can barely uh, work with these uh, with these experiments. So what we really need uh, are a multi-scale models. I would like to show you uh, an example here of a multi-scale model, uh, one that we developed for uh, this microvascular obstruction condition. So it's a benchtop model. On the left-hand side on this photo, you see a pulse duplicator, which is replicating what the whole heart is doing, pulsating, uh, pushing up blood. And on this uh, white table, 
you see a lot of tubing, and this is actually a model for the coronary circulation. And in the center, this little box here, this is again a microfluidic tip, which is modeling a small part of the microcirculation where these obstructions are. This is actually on the bottom here, uh, a few photos of, uh, of this microfluidic chips uh, where we do an experiment uh, of infusion of a, of, a, of a dye to see where, for instance, a, a pharmaceutical agent could be transported to. And the top part is open, so that's where it's flowing in nicely. And the bottom part is, uh, is actually obstructed or partially obstructed, so there's less uh, medication coming. So that's what it can do on uh, an experimental multi-scale modeling. And of course, you can also do this computationally. And this I would like to show you on the example of cystic fibrosis of the lung. Cystic fibrosis is a congenital disease. It's a chronic disease progressing over many years. Um, it leads to the formation of mucus inside the small airways. And uh, it's desirable to diagnose this disease very, very early, already at the infant stage, because then uh, um, the treatment can be very effective. The problem is that at the infant stage, um, it's very hard to detect this, this illness because the mucus uh, has not yet formed, right, luckily, but uh, uh, the, the obstructions are only in the really smallest airways. And these airways are, of course, not accessible by common tools and, and the doctor cannot see. So what uh, pneumologists are, are doing to, to, to study a uh, condition of lungs of the smallest airways is to use a, a so-called multiple breath washout. Uh, what is this? A multiple breath washout uh, uh, measures the concentration of nitrogen in the exhaled air. So uh, if you're breathing normally, your lung will be filled with normal air, Nitrogen is more or less an inert gas. So there will be, on average, well, not on average, there will be 78% of nitrogen uh, everywhere in your lung. And this is depicted in this model by the red color. So that's 78% nitrogen concentration. This is a graph model. Uh, it has a, it's a fractal geometry. And at the end, we place these trumpet-like structures to model like the, the, the acinar structures with the, this uh, porous like uh, uh, alveoli in it. Yeah? They have certain mechanical properties that can be modeled. Here is the inhalation. The patient who is being tested puts such a device in his mouth and, uh, and there's a flow sensor in it and the sensor for nitrogen. So as the test is starting, the patient inhales pure oxygen. So no nitrogen anymore. Maybe start the simulation or the animation. So you see in blue, blue is 0% nitrogen or 100% oxygen. And you see that with every inhalation, you inhale the oxygen. And with every exhalation, you exhale part of the nitrogen that is left in the lungs. So with every breath, the lung is more and more washed out of nitrogen. And you see that the nitrogen concentration is decreasing. Uh, it's relatively heterogeneous because that's how the lung is, is formed. And what the doctor is actually seeing, the doctor of course not seeing what's happening inside the lung, what the doctor is seeing is only this curve. This is the concentration of nitrogen in the exhaled air. And you might also notice here that uh, uh, there's a there's a region here where it's still red. This is actually a, a little obstruction that we included in one of the, the airways um, uh, to, to create, a, a, to model a, a, a little lesion here. And this is a pocket where the nitrogen is sitting longer. And of course, this will modify the shape of this curve. And it's not only the overall, the global shape of this decay, which is uh, roughly exponential, you can also look at the single exhalations, right? You can zoom in into one of these exhalations. Let me do some next slide. And you can discriminate different phases of the exhalation, and especially the phase three, which is related to the air exhaled from the lowest part of the lung 
is of interest for cystic fibrosis diagnosis. Uh, what doctors are measuring is usually the slope of this phase three. And we use this forward model here that I showed you to do a parameter study, right? Classical study you do with the forward model, you modify parameters and you see what the effect it has on the outcome at the moment. Now, this works all pretty well, and it's, it's cool for our understanding at the same time. That's not really what the, the doctors are looking for. They would like to say, I have this, uh, this, this result from my test. Tell me where the lesion is. That's what they usually are asking. So we somehow need to turn this around. We need to uh, get some parameter measurements. To introduce this concept, I would like to show you my fourth example, arterial venous malformations. Arterial venous malformations uh, are malformations of the vascular tree. On the left, you have a normal vascular tree, a red arteries, blue the veins, and in between, you have the capillary bed, which are small vessels, high resistance, low flow, big pressure drop from red to blue. Now that's normal. In an AVM, eh? AVM is short for arterial venous malformation, you have a shunting between, or shunt between uh, the two sides. You have a fistula, can be relatively complex in shape. And what is happening is you have relatively high flow because these vessels are relatively large. Uh, you have much less of a pressure drop through that. So you have a high, a too high pressure on the venous side the tissue is not made for that, so it will uh, inflate. You get swelling of the tissue around it. You might get aneurysms. You will get a steal of blood because most of the blood will be flowing through this shortcutting back to the heart. And the tissue downstream of this AVM will not receive enough blood. So you get ischemia in the extremities. And there's a few other things which make this a, a rather bad uh, uh, lesion of your vascular system and it should be removed by, uh, by a doctor. Now, the treatment of such an AVM highly depends on the uh, uh, architecture of such an AVM, angio architectures, as, as the angiologists are calling it. There's classifications of different types of AVMs. And you see here such a classification, type one through type four AVM, different levels of complex. Now, unfortunately, uh, this is not what the doctor sees. Uh, you can see this, uh, these nice sketches. What the doctor sees is this here on the right-hand side. These are three examples of uh, angiographies for different types of AVMs. And you have to think of this uh, as movies uh, from top to bottom. So it starts with the injection of a contrast agent into an artery. It's uh, going downstream. And here, this is the AVM, probably this here is a larger aneurysm. And after some time, the contrast agent will return uh, through the veins. Huh? So these are the veins here. And uh, a well-trained doctor will be able to watch these movies over and over again, and uh, will be able to uh, infer just from seeing these movies, what type of AVM this is, depending on how the contrast agent is returning, how diluted it is, how much time it took for the contrast agent. This is really art for a well-trained uh, doctor. Now we try to get a bit more deterministic and to build a, a model of that. We uh, essentially a lump parameter model of this vascular tree. The base elements were the elements shown here, uh, comprising capacitance, uh, resistive elements, and inertness. And uh, we put them together into a, a full body model, starting here at the heart, going through the unaffected part of the body, through the capillary bed here, and back on the venous side, back to the heart. Then there's the affected part of the body, it might be an arm or a leg, and that has a shunt here from the AVM, shunting the capillary and the, the, the way this shunt is, is formed can, of course, be uh, formed in different ways. This is how we can design uh, different types, different angio architectures. 
uh, AVMs can also be present inside the microcirculation, inside the capillary bed. So we actually took this uh, uh, part, which models the capillary bed, and replaced it by such uh, uh, prototypical models of a capillary bed. Now, of course, there's a huge variety in the way this capillary bed is formed. There's a huge variety in how the shunts are actually uh, organized, what the topology of the network is. And uh, we try to use statistical data to start off from this baseline model and create different possible realizations of uh, um, um, capillary beds, models of capillary beds. So we ended up with about, uh, I think, 200 different uh, models of the, of the capillary bed with and without different types of inputs. And we used our, our, our model here that I showed here to uh, put virtually contrast agent through these models. We had a certain input function shown here in red, that's like the bolus uh, of, of, uh, of contrast agent injected, and we check what comes out on the other end. And of course, depending on how the, 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 uh, the architecture of the, the capillary bed is, is, is organized, you get different results. More delay, less delay, more dispersion, less dispersion. And we could plot this in this chart here, uh, which shows here the delay uh, of the, the bolus as it returns and the dispersivity. So essentially the width of the bolus. And uh, we did this for all these prototypic or for all these realizations of uh, possible networks, one with uh, these capillary venulus AVM, one with type four AVM, type three and type two AVM and here in green, no AVM to so the healthy baseline case. And luckily, they, uh, they, they cluster nicely. So this is a map that could actually be used by doctors to classify their AVMs. Uh, to test that, we also use clinical data. We actually sampled from real uh, uh, angiographies, sampled uh, the, the input and uh, the output. And then you can think of that there's a transfer function which convolution of the input with the transfer function creates the output. And so we could determine what, uh, what the transfer function looks like and also plot these in the same chart. These are the circles here. And you see that they actually match our predictions. So uh, this is, uh, I think, a nice example of how we can actually uh, uh, help doctors uh, get tools from which they can actually infer uh, what the small scale lesion looks like. Uh, a final example I would like to show you here is the example of multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is a, it's a chronic disease of the nervous system. Uh, it affects the myelin sheath of the, the axons. But what it also does, it uh, affects the blood-brain barrier. So what that means is it makes the capillary vessels in the brain leaky. So wherever you have such an inflammation, an MS plaque, as the doctor call it, you get leaky vessels. So if you put contrast agent through the vessels, uh, you infuse contrast agent uh, in the blood, uh, the contrast agent will leak out wherever you have uh, such, a, such a lesion, such an MS plaque and inflammation. And uh, this spot therefore will light up brightly in the, in the MR. Which looks like here on the left, you have such uh, an MRI picture of a patient with uh, an MS lesion, it's this white spot here, it's very classical. If you sample here the signal in this voxel, these are large voxels, like two by two millimeters, uh, you get this signal here, this red curve here. If you sample it uh, in a, on, a, on the other side where it's supposedly healthy, uh, it's called NAWM, normal, normally appearing white matter, uh, you get this green curve. And the question is, can we produce a tool which allows the medical doctor to take these two curves and directly infer from the curve how leaky, quantitatively, how leaky the capillaries are? Because the leakiness gives a direct information about the state of inflammation of the lesion. Now, keep in mind that this leakiness is not happening 
at the scale of these voxels at this two millimeter scale, it's actually happening in these small capillary structures we see here. This is an actual uh, capillary network of, uh, of a brain cortex. I can see these vessels, here's a zoom. This is one of these vessels. They're approximately five microns wide. And so we have a huge scale gap. The way you can address this uh, uh, can be done or is typically done by uh, two compartment models we see here on the left. Uh, with a vascular compartment and an extravascular compartment and a certain transfer between the two. Now these uh, two compartment models are not so successful for this application. So uh, we uh, reverted to a mixed dimensional model. And when I say we, I should point out, this is actually the great work of Timo Koch uh, from the group of, of Rainer Helmig and Ben Flemish from Stuttgart. So that was really excellent uh, work that we recently published. And uh, this model uh, comprises a microvascular tree, so a bunch of capillaries that carry the contrast agent and can affect it through the system. And this vascular tree, microvascular tree, is embedded in this three dimensional extravascular space that we treat as a porous medium. Yeah? So you have here a Darcy type flow in the extravascular space, you have a viscous flow in in the, the, the microvascular uh, network, and you have a transport of, of fluid across the walls of, uh, uh, of, of, of the, the vasculatures, according to, to the Starling uh, law. And uh, you have transport of oxygen here inside the vasculature, mostly advective. You have a transport uh, with the Darcy flow inside the extravascular space. And you have a, a, a diffusive transport across the walls. And uh, we'll see later on, it's especially this parameter, D omega here, which is the diffusive wall conductivity, which uh, will give us information about the leakiness. So this is a model with a lot of parameters. Uh, we were actually able to boil this down to uh, in eight parameters. And uh, one of the obvious things you can do is you, you can uh, run your computer and then uh, try to find a, a parameter, try to find the best set of parameters which matches uh, the, the, the measured data. And we can actually find that. And uh, we have here these two sets of parameters, which are of course different for the lesion and the control case. And if we look here at this D omega, we see that the the diffusive wall conductivity is about one order of magnitude larger than in the control case. Okay, so we could say, well, perfect, problem understood, problem solved, we're done. Now, uh, this is not the, the complete truth. Um, we need to keep in mind that this is a biological system. There's a lot of uncertainties in the system and all of these parameters here have a certain level of uncertainty, sometimes operator dependence, sometimes depending on the imaging system, on the MR system, sometimes depending on the patient itself. So we should appreciate this uncertainty and dig deeper. So what we did is to use a Markov chain Monte Carlo to sample uh, in, a, in, a, in an efficient way from this huge parameter space and use parameter Bayesian, Bayesian parameter inference uh, uh, to, to learn more about uh, uh, the, the, the posterior distribution of, of, uh, of, of these parameters. And here's what we can learn from this. Uh, we get these beautiful large plots, which will uh, not explain in too much detail, but I just want to point out mainly here on the bottom right, these histograms. So these are estimations on the probability distributions for the parameter the omega on the right for the control case and on the left for the lesion case. And we see that these histograms, which are approximations to, to, to the PEF, um, have a peak here at seven. So that's logarithmic scale is 10 to the minus seven. And this one has a peak at 10 to the minus eight or let me maybe pull out these two histograms and put them side by side. So this is the same histogram for the lesion case, peaking somewhere around 10 to the minus seven. And 
here, peak in rank ten to the minus eight and much broader. So these are approximations or estimations for the probability distribution for this parameter given the prior that we have measured either this curve or the other curve. So this is an honest, well, yeah, let's call it an honest representation or a careful representation, uh, including all the uncertainty in the result. That is exactly how uh, doctors are working. They don't want to have a, a single yes or no answer. They want to understand how probable it is that it's one way or the other. So let me uh, uh, finish and, and summarize here. So what have we done? We have a multi-scale uh, model of, uh, of disease, and we have used it to be able to directly infer from clinically observable data something about local microscopic parameters, namely the leakiness of a vessel. We can really quantify now in a probabilistic sense what the leakiness of these vessels are. What are the take home messages? There is a scale challenge in clinical medicine. Currently, our interventional tools are unable to access the microscopic lesions and the diagnostic modalities, the imaging modalities are unable to resolve them. And this will remain like that for well, probably quite a while. We should use multi-scale modeling of organs to close this scale gap, but at the same time, we should use these multi-scale models in combination with parameter and inference methods, methods of uncertainty quantification to respect A, the inherent uncertainty of biological systems and B, to provide clinically meaningful data. So uh, with that, I would like to close here and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Obris. And now Carolyn's going to see if there's questions for you. Hi, yes, there are. Oh, I have a, just a second. Just a second, there are, um, Questions in the for the uh, post at the award ceremony. Let me read them uh, to you. Um, Tisa said, "Great talk. In these examples, you are modeling individual organs. How far are we from modeling the whole human body so that we can look at interactions?" Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, of course, a difficult question to ask uh, or to answer. Uh, I don't, uh, I, I would, would actually return a question on how meaningful would it be to, to model the whole body? Um, of course, there may be interactions between two organs and then uh, it's probably meaningful to model uh, these two organs in combination. But to model the whole body, uh, it might be a, a great challenge from a modeling point of view and computational point of view, but I'm not sure we can learn that much. And if you look at these models a bit more closely, you will see that uh, we, we always had to make a lot of idealizations and simplifications, which were okay for that very specific disease we wanted to study, but which may not be okay as soon as we step out to the left or to the right of the, the question. So maybe a simple answer, I think we're very far away uh, at the same time, I don't think we should really strive to create this single big model of the whole body. We should always try to have specific models for specific reasons. Okay, thank you. Then there's another question from Fred Vermolen. He says, thank you for your nice talk. Uh, he has a question concerning slide 29. And uh, he asks, do you estimate? Mm. Slide 29. Let me see if I can unmute him. Okay, he should be able to unmute himself and speak if you would like to elaborate. Right, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, yeah, well, thank you very much for your very nice talk, uh, Dominique. Um, 
really exciting. Uh, the things that you are doing, and it's very similar to what we are doing, in fact, um, but for some different applications. In particular, what I also like is the uh, statistical uh, approach, uh, the Bayesian uh, parameter interference inference. So I really uh, appreciate that. So I was actually wondering, um, so at a certain point you, um, you, you construct a histogram, right? In, mm -hmm. in slide 29. Yes. And yeah, my question is, do you, do you also um, um, estimate the, the, the cumulative uh, probability distribution from this histogram? Uh, cumulative probabilities of, of what? Um, of, of yeah, well, you have this histogram. I, I do not recall what kind of um, um, uh, result you had over there. So it was a histogram for something, right? I don't recall it anymore. Yeah, it's uh, it's this uh, uh, diffusive wall conductivity. It's actually I just pulled out uh, that that histogram here. I mean, of course, uh, for a careful analysis, you would need to look at all histograms and also yeah. the cross correlations. And I, I just simplified here a bit and then just pointed out the, the most relevant one. Yeah, and are you, are you also interested in things like uh, uh, probabilities or a probability for, for a failure or, or success of treatments, of therapies? Um, let me think, I mean, we, we, well, the simple answer is no, we have not looked into that. Uh, whether I'm interested in it or not, uh, let me be honest, I have not thought about it. Uh, we have not come across uh, this, this, this way of asking the question yet. But uh, I'm, I'm confident. I, uh, well, you probably know it uh, as, as well as I do. Whenever we deal with, uh, with, with, uh, with biological systems, we have to respect the uncertainty. And I believe in your, in your uh, plenary uh, lecture, you also mentioned that. And you sure, yeah. you yeah. it's going exactly that direction. So I... Uh, I think we need to use these tools. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So far, there are no um, additional questions in the Q&A chat. So please, if you have any questions, um, type them uh, in Q&A, either to the award ceremony or um, the keynote. Well, I, I had a question. What was your what was your micro model made out of? What was the substrate material? Uh, substrate material of which? Uh, the one where you showed us the experimental setup for the heart. I think it was the heart. Um, oh, okay. You mean the, the physical, the, the, the microfluidic chip? Yes. That's yes. silicon. So. Okay. And then the fluids were what? Uh, well, it depends. Uh, so in the simplest case, we just use water. Um, we also use a mixture of glycerin, glycerin and, and, and water to, to model uh, the viscosity because uh, you're in a, uh, in a range where the Reynolds number is small, but maybe not so small. So you might have very small inertial effects. And so it matters if you infuse water, you might get some small inertial effects, or if you infuse uh, blood or something with viscosity of blood, where then you will run into the, the, the domain of fossil flow. And then do you worry about the uh, fluid solid interaction, uh, you know, uh, let's say water to silicon versus water and human tissue? Yeah, yeah. And th this is certainly a, a limitation of these models, right? So uh, we have silicon because it's known to, to work well with the red blood cells. I mm -hmm. assume you're addressing also the red blood cells. Red blood cells uh, are, are very delicate uh, creatures. If they become unhappy, they will change their shape. They will uh, resist deformation. They will become echinocytes, stomatocytes. Uh, so you have to treat them really well. And apparently, uh, a combination with silicon is something that they like. Wow. But, uh, uh, to, to become better, I mean, uh, next steps, and some groups are doing this already, they're lining their microchannels with endothelial cells. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay, so there is another question asked by James McClure. He is asking, one of the suggested mechanisms for COVID-19 inflammatory response is the role of bradykinin in causing 
excessive permeability in the vascular system. Can mechanistic modeling offer insights here? I, I love that question. I, to be honest, uh, we, we had a, quite a few brainstorming sessions in my group because I realized, well, this is now way to go if you can put COVID-19 on a proposal. That's a, that's a good thing. Um, to, be, to be honest, uh, we couldn't come up with a, with a meaningful experiment where we could add to, to the knowledge. But uh, I certainly agree with you. I mean, there, there's something in there and there are all these results where uh, uh, the problems of COVID-19 can be related to problems in the microvascular. To be honest, I do not know enough about it to, to really be able to say what we could do with our, with our platforms. So there is yet another um, question. It's from Lilith Ye Hyun Saryan. Uh, she's um, saying, wonderful talks. Thank you, Dominic. You had a slide with a diagram with symbols like electrical circuit diagram. Yes. Could you please explain how it is constructed? Yes, I can do that. Um, so essentially, you can, uh, uh, you can start off with, with Navier-Stokes equations, and then you can uh, um, bring them down to, to 1D, and then you can uh, make a few simplifications. Let me see where this slide is. So eventually you, you can end up, I mean, if you have a simple viscous flow through a straight tube, you can always replace this just by uh, a simple resistance on it. And if you uh, want to respect pulsatility, uh, you have to include the inertance. So this is this element here. So there's certain, uh, uh, let's say, uh, electrical uh, analogous. And the capacitance comes in because the vessels are compliant. Mm -hmm. So the vessels can inflate and can store some blood or, or can, can release some blood. So this is the electrical equivalent circuit of a single simple uh, 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 flow, laminar flow, unsteady laminar flow in a vessel with compliance. This is not our invention. Uh, this is uh, it's, uh, many people are, are using these these models. So at the moment, I don't see any additional questions. Please, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I think we're approaching the time here for the closing ceremony. And so I, I suggest if people have additional questions to please contact Dr. Obers. And I thank you for a very, very fascinating talk and which highlights the commonality among different types of porous media. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. Good evening. Yeah.